As the sun set, on the day that Kenny Ong's burnt remains were found, a cloud of darkness hangs over the community. Everyone was on edge. News of the brutal murder had rocked the entire neighbourhood. It was the kind of tragedy that seemed too horrific to be true. But unfortunately, it was all too real for the residents in Kuala Lumpur. In the days following the discovery of Kenny's body, every newspaper in Malaysia covered the story extensively, with headlines featuring words like abducted, killed and burned splashed across the front page. People were afraid to go out at night, and parents were keeping their children closer than ever before. The neighbourhood became eerily silent, as if the weight of the tragedy had sucked all the life out of the community. As the investigation into Kenny Ong's murder began, the police focused their search on the construction site where her body was first discovered. They combed the area looking for any clues or evidence that could lead them to the killer. However, as investigators collected evidence from the site, they quickly realised that it wasn't going to be enough. The evidence they gathered provided little to no insight into the identity of the criminal, leaving them with more questions than answers. The lack of witnesses also made it incredibly challenging to establish any leads, causing the investigation to come to a halt. The gravity of the situation was already overwhelming, but it was made even worse when a deeply unsettling and disturbing detail was revealed by the autopsy report of Kenny Ong. According to the forensic pathologist, there was evidence to suggest that Kenny had been raped before being murdered. The presence of semen inside her remains confirmed this, and the revelation was met with an outpour of shock and revulsion from the community. Now, the pressure to deliver justice was mounting. The killer was still out there, somewhere in Kuala Lumpur. At the time, head of the CID, Abu Bakar Mustafa, had stated that this was a unique case, even for a seasoned investigator like himself. The manner in which Kenny was abducted and killed suggested that the man who did this was an expert in murder. Abu Bakar cited the precise planning and execution of the crime, which showed that the killer knew exactly what he was doing. But without any significant developments in the case, the investigation stalled, leaving Kenny's family on edge and desperate for answers. The silence was finally broken several days later, when a police officer, Corporal Ravi Chandran, brought forth a vital piece of evidence that would prove to be a game-changer. Yes, I give you my word that we are doing everything we can to solve this case as soon as possible. Yes, yes. Sir, can I come in? Officer Ravi Chandran said as he waited outside the head of the CID's office. Yes, yes. Come in, Ravi. Take a seat. What can I do for you? Abu Bakar replied as his eyes were glued to the stack of reports on his table. <laughs> Sir, I... I have something you need to see. It's regarding the Kenny Ong case. Reaching into his pocket, Officer Ravi Chandran pulled out two identification cards and placed them onto the table. Ravi, where, where the hell did you get this? These two cards were perhaps the biggest pieces of evidence they had come across so far because one of them bore the name Kenny Ong Lei Kien and the other, a mysterious man. You're listening to Heinous, an Asian true crime podcast brought to you by Mediacorp and produced by 1UP Media. This episode might contain scenes of violence and criminal activity. Listener discretion is advised. On the 14th of June, 2003, Corporal Ravi Chandran and his partner were undercover, dressed in plain clothes as they rode on their motorcycles, patrolling the streets of an industrial area. Earlier on, they were instructed to be on the lookout for a light blue Proton Tiara 
that might have been stolen. They were also told that it was regarding a missing persons case, but other than that, they were in the dark. This was the day after Kenny Ong had disappeared, and at the time, not much was known about the case. Officer Ravi Chandran scanned the area, searching for any signs of the car. As they turned onto a narrow, dark street, a car parked by the side of the road caught his attention. It seemed out of place, as if it was waiting for something. As he got closer, he noticed that the car's window was rolled down halfway. In the dim light, he could see a Malay man in the driver's seat, his knuckles white as they gripped the steering wheel. Beside him, a Chinese woman was leaning forward, her hands clasped tightly together in her lap. They were speaking in hushed tones, but Ravi Chandran could tell that their conversation was heated. Their postures were stiff and their expressions tense. Without a second thought, he knocked on the car window. Excuse me, what are you doing in this area? Ravi Chandran said, his voice laced with suspicion. Nothing, sir. This is my girlfriend here. We were just discussing an issue she has with her family. The man's response was quick and smooth, but Ravi Chandran had his doubts. Unconvinced by the man's explanation, he requested the couple to hand over their ID cards. With a careful eye, Ravi Chandran inspected the ID cards and identified the driver as a 27-year-old man by the name of Ahmad Najib bin Aris. Then, he identified the woman sitting beside him as 28-year-old Ong Lee Kian. As he continued to question the couple, he noticed the woman in the front seat making clear signs of distress. She was hunched forward in her seat, her palms discreetly clenched tightly in her lap. Her eyes were wide with fear, and Ravi Chandran could see her lips moving silently, as if she were pleading for help. It was a small gesture, but it caught his attention. He then directs his attention towards the woman and firmly asks her to step out of the car. However, before she could even make a move, Ahmad Najib raised his voice in a sudden outburst of anger. He hurriedly fired up the car engine and rolled up the windows. Ravi Chandran knew that he was about to make a run for it, so he pulled out his service pistol and fired two shots towards the front tyre of the car. Ahmad Najib immediately stepped on the gas and sped off, leaving Ravi Chandran and his partner behind in a cloud of dust. Without hesitation, the two officers quickly mounted their motorbikes and began chasing after the light blue Proton. Despite their best efforts, however, the car continued to gain distance, and soon, it was out of sight. But Ravi Chandran still had the identification cards inside his pocket. Ahmad Najib bin Aris, the man identified through the identification cards, was believed to have been the last person seen with Kenny on the night of a brutal murder. Now, the police had a face and a name. All that was left to do was to find him. But before we continue, I'd like to tell you about another podcast from 1UP Media. Empires is an immersive podcast that dives deep into the history behind the most successful businesses in Asia. Every week, you learn the history of its leaders, the decisions that have rippled across the industry, and the factors that allowed them to become the empires they are today. From triumphant victories to monumental failures, Empires gets you behind the scenes of some of the most successful companies in Asia. Empires, an Asian business podcast, is now available on Spotify. Several days into the investigation, a witness named Amina makes a report to the police that she saw a man replacing a punctured tyre on the highway. She claims that while she was in her car, a man approached her, asking to borrow a car jack to remove the tyre. As he struggled with the tyre, she noticed the woman inside the Proton making odd faces, as if she was trying to signal for help. The man eventually gave up on replacing the tyre and sped off into the night with the woman. 
But before they disappeared, Amina managed to note down the car's registration number. This was a crucial detail in the case, as it confirmed police suspicions of Ahmad Najib. The police then launched a massive manhunt for the man who was last seen with Kenny. But it was also crucial to ensure that their efforts were kept a secret. Hush. After all, Ahmad Najib was still a free man, and the slightest mistake could potentially lead to his disappearance or escape. Relying heavily on the information written on Ahmad's ID card, police quickly stormed his residential address, but their efforts were in vain as Ahmad had provided false details. A troubling pattern was now revealed. Ahmad Najib had a long history of falsifying records, including falsified employment records. Investigators knew that in order to get a better lead, they needed to get creative. Hence, they decided to search for his name on the National Marriage Registry, a decision that was critical. They learned that Ahmad Najib was married and worked as an aircraft cabin cleaner at the time. His wife's place of work was also listed, and so for the next two days, undercover police were dispatched to watch her every move. They followed her as she went to work and returned home to a residential complex in Pantai Dalam, southwest of Kuala Lumpur. Undercover police were then deployed to surround the area, hoping to apprehend Ahmad Najib as he returned home. But for three whole days, nothing. On July 20, 2003, their patience and diligence finally paid off. Upon spotting Ahmad Najib getting out of a taxi, the police moved quickly and brought him into custody. After his arrest, it became apparent that investigators had underestimated Ahmad Najib. During the interrogation, he had insisted that he would only speak to the head of the CID, Abu Bakr Mustafa. It also seemed that Ahmad Najib was well prepared to be caught, which made the investigation much more difficult. During an interview with Officer Abu Bakr, he says, Najib's tactic was to keep turning the tables on us. He forced us to prove we had concrete evidence against him before he would admit to anything. Police continued to pile on the pressure and after several gruelling hours of questioning, Ahmad Najib finally breaks. He confesses to police that he had indeed abducted and killed Kenny Ong. With enough time and pressure, even the most cunning of criminals may experience feelings of regret or shame for their actions. In this case, the weight of guilt and shame became too much for him to bear, leading him to confess to his crimes. For the next few days, he brings police to several locations associated with the horrific rape and murder. During this time, more forensic evidence was gathered close to the location where Kenny's body was found. In the course of the next few hours, Ahmad Najib gives a detailed account to police how he kidnapped, raped and killed Kenny Ong. At the Bangsa shopping complex in Kuala Lumpur, Ahmad Najib reveals that he spotted Kenny searching for something inside her car. He then approached her silently and pushed her inside the vehicle, shutting the doors behind her. He then got into the driver's seat and sped off, crashing through the car park barriers on the way out. To ensure that Kenny wouldn't scream or ask for help, he admitted holding a knife against her. He says he told her that if she had shouted for help, he would kill her right there and then. Ahmad Najib then admits to driving Kenny to a quiet location in an industrial area. The same area where Corporal Ravi Chandran shot the vehicle's tyres. After successfully evading the officers, he then drove her to a dark and quiet construction site and proceeded to rape her. After that, he drove to an even quieter location where he raped her for the second time. But during this incident, Kenny resisted and he stabbed her twice in the abdomen, causing her to bleed. Panicking, he quickly decides to abandon Kenny at the construction site. 
After lifting her out of the car, Ahmad Najib spots an open manhole nearby. He then proceeds to tie her hands and mouth with cloth and drags her several meters towards the manhole, stopping right at the edge. It was at this moment that both Ahmad Najib and Kenny heard the morning call to prayer. Ahmad Najib also discloses Kenny's final words to him. As she lay there bleeding, she begged him to go home because she too could hear the mosque's call to prayer and would like to pray too. Ahmad Najib then placed Kenny's hands across the chest and threw her into the open manhole. As Kenny lay inside the manhole, her mother Pearlie and her best friend Noreen were just a few kilometers away, desperately searching for her. Ahmad Najib then came back to the scene after 16 long hours, equipped with a can of petrol and a lighter. Kenny's body was then doused with petrol and set ablaze. Three months after the brutal murder, the trial of Kenny Ong commenced on September 15, 2003. The proceedings were marked by a series of shocking developments, including Ahmad Najib's unexpected plea of not guilty. He claimed that the confession he made earlier was obtained under duress, alleging that he was coerced and tortured by the police. Ahmad Najib's defense team, which consisted of the renowned lawyer Muhammad Hanif Khatri Abdullah, and five other criminal lawyers had advised him to plead not guilty as they were determined to exploit every possible weakness in the prosecution's case. During the trial, Hanif and his defense team raises a perplexing question. They point out that Kenny had a black belt in Taekwondo, and yet she didn't resist or try to escape. Muhammad Hanif says, Your Honor, why did she not take a chance to escape the car? when Ahmad Najib was busy trying to replace the tyre. And given that she had a black belt in martial arts, it would not be impossible for her to escape Ahmad Najib's clutches. The question creates an atmosphere of uncertainty and disbelief in the courtroom. The prosecution is then called upon to rebut. Chief Prosecutor Saleh Houdin responds, Your Honour, it's not right to say that the victim should have put up a fight or that she was to blame for not seizing an opportunity to escape. Sure, it's easy to say this, but how could she have run? It was 2 o'clock in the morning, and she didn't know where she was. On top of that, she had been stabbed. The courtroom is silent, pondering over the statements made between the two sides. Then, the prosecution turns their attention to forensic evidence. They called forensic scientists to the stand, who testified that the DNA samples taken from the semen found in Kenny's body was a match to Ahmad Najib. Additionally, they also testified that the pieces of cloth used to bound Kenny's hands and mouth were an exact match to the ones used in Ahmad Najib's workplace. They revealed that the materials used to make the cloths was specifically designed to clean aircraft, and it was a unique type of cloth that was not easily accessible to the public. The prosecution then asserted that the defence had failed to present any convincing argument to create reasonable doubt about the case against Ahmad Najib and had instead relied on mere denials, which do not constitute a valid defence. The judge pronounced that the evidence presented was compelling and convincing and that he had indeed committed the crimes against Kenny Ong beyond any reasonable doubt. After a 52-day trial on the 23rd of February 2005, the Shah Alam High Court delivered its verdict, finding Ahmad Najib guilty of the charges of murder and rape. He was sentenced to death. Ahmad Najib's only hope to escape the death penalty is to appeal for mercy from the Sultan of Selangor, asking for his death sentence to be commuted to life imprisonment.
Ahmad Najib was granted an opportunity to write a letter of appeal to the Sultan, in which he denied his guilt of the rape and murder charges brought against him. The letter was lengthy, but it concluded with, If my appeal is rejected by your royal highness, I will humbly accept your decision. Several days later, the Sultan replies, rejecting his appeal for pardon. On the 23rd of September 2016, 13 years after Kenny Ong's murder, 40-year-old Ahmad Najib bin Aris was executed by hanging in Kajang prison. Years after the tragic incident, Pearlie, Kenny's mother, still lights a candle in front of her daughter's portrait every night. She has devoted the rest of her life to keeping Kenny's memory alive and honouring her. Sometimes, she often still pretends that her daughter is still alive and in America. In a heart-wrenching interview, Pearlie says, When you lose someone, your biggest regret is not being good enough to that person. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Heinous, an Asian true crime podcast brought to you by MediaCorp and produced by 1UP Media. If you would like to share some feedback or suggest other cases that you would like us to cover, head on down to our website at asiantruecrimepodcast.com. This episode was researched, produced, and written by Yeo Guang Jin with audio engineering by Ethan Sam. Special thanks to executive producers Danny Cordy and Barry To from MediaCorp. We hope to see you again soon in the next episode of Heinous.